First, you can use of creating new viral variants specifically designed against tumor cells by rounds of directed selection using large populations of randomly generated recombinant precursor viruses. That is a lot of words, I realize it, so let's break that down. So what this means is you start with recombinant precursor viruses. So you can start off with your, your favorite virus of your choosing, your favorite uh, lytic virus, and you can put it in a population of cancer cells, and then you can specifically select viruses that are the best at killing a certain population of cancer cells. You can take those viruses that were produced, put them into a, another plate of cancer cells, and do this for many, many rounds so that you select the most highly efficient virus um, that's capable of uh, killing cancer cells. An example of this uh, was an adenovirus that was used to create what was called the Colo AD1 uh, oncolytic virus. And this is actually a hybrid of two different adenovirus serotypes. So uh, these scientists, when they were generating this virus, they combined, they put a bunch of adenoviruses together so that they can recombine. Um, and they found that this hybrid was the most efficient at killing uh, cancer cells. It has a really high po uh, potency and has very high tumor uh, selectivity compared to the control viruses, so the two serotypes separately. And also what they found is that you can have, you have much higher viral progeny titer in human colon tumor tissue compared to normal tissue. Now what I mean by that is that if you were to take this colo AD1 oncolytic virus and infect tumor cells as opposed to normal tissue cells, the tumor cells produce a much higher viral titer compared to the normal tissues. This implies that there's much more replication and much more infection happening, meaning that there's more death of these tumor tissues happening as well. Now directed evolution is a great way to start, but you can also genetically manipulate viruses to do what you would like them to do. And one way of doing this is by attenuating viruses. So attenuation of viruses is the deletion of viral genes or gene regions or eliminating viral functions that are expendable in tumor cells to make viruses safer and more tumor specific. Now again, a lot of words, big concept, let's break that down. So viruses are really unique in that they are obligate intracellular organisms. And that means that they depend on host factors to survive and to replicate and to generate more progeny. Now, depending on the cell type that a virus infects, it may need more or less things from the host. So for example, a virus needs to be actively replicating uh, in order to generate more progeny, which means that it depends on a lot of nucleic acid synthesizers and a lot of protein production. Now, if a virus is infecting a cell that's not replicating, which means that it's not undergoing DNA synthesis, that virus is not going to be able to replicate because if the virus depends on the host to make its own DNA and the host is not making DNA because the cell is not replicating, the virus cannot replicate. However, in tumor cells, tumor cells are highly, highly replica, uh, they're replicating at very, very fast and very high rates which means that viruses that depend on cell replication functions are, would be much more readily uh, replicatable in tumor cells relative to other cells. So an example of this is as follows. So uh, proteins, as I mentioned, that are necessary in DNA synthesis are expressed only in actively replicating cells because cells that aren't replicating do not need to replicate their DNA. Some viruses, such as HSV and Vaccinia, encode proteins to replicate in non-dividing cells. So there are viruses that don't encode any proteins and are only dependent on the presence of host proteins to replicate their DNA. However, other viruses have evolved to basically do the functions that they want the host cell to do. So HSV and Vaccinia encode proteins to replicate their own DNA in non-dividing cells. So HSV and Vaccinia are not dependent on their host cells to be replicating because they encode their own proteins to do the DNA replicating function. However, if you were to delete these proteins from the genome of the virus, then these viruses revert back to being dependent on host factors to synthesize their DNA and thus to replicate. 
And so when you inactivate these viral genes, the viruses that previously could divide in non-dividing cells can no longer. So they require highly replicating cells to replicate. And that's one way of attenuating your HSV to make it uh, more, to make it target tumor cells more than non-dividing host cells. In addition, you can do specific tumor targeting. And in order to do specific tumor targeting, it can be done in a variety of different ways. You can do it in a transduction way, in which modifications are added to protein coat proteins to target tumor cells. And what I mean by this is that many viruses depend on interactions with host cell proteins in order to fuse into the host cell. Now, most viruses have evolved to infect cells that they've evolved to infect, such as healthy tissue. However, if you know highly unique proteins that are expressed on the surfaces of cancer cells, you can create viruses that can only fuse into those cancer cells based on those unique proteins on the surface of cancer cells. And this has mostly been studied, again, in adenoviruses and HSV. In addition, there's non-transductional ways. Um, and this way, you can alter the genome of the virus so it can only replicate in cancer cells. So again, this is really similar to attenuation of the virus. And um, in addition, you could also modify the virus so that it has tumor-specific promoters for critical viral genes. So what I mean by this is if you look at your cancer or the tumor that a patient has, and you can see uh, transcription factors that are specific for that tumor, you can generate viruses in which viral genes expression is dependent on the presence of that transcription factor. So if you have a transcription factor that's unique for your, vi for your cancer and your virus replication depends on that unique transcription factor, viruses will only replicate in the presence of that transcription factor and that means just within the tumor. So these are all a variety of different ways to modify viruses to make them target cancer cells specifically without harming the other cells of the host. Now let's go through a specific example of this, which is called TVEC. Uh, so TVEC was used in the treatment of advanced and operable melanomas, and it, select, it specifically replicates in and lysis tumor cells. Now how was this done, and how was this generated? Well, TVEC is based on herpes uh, simplex virus type 1. I've mentioned it's a very popular go-to when developing oncolytic viruses. And it's been modified in a variety of different ways. So it has three major modifications. First, there's two non-essential viral genes that have been deleted. First, this gene ICP34.5 was deleted, and this attenuates viral pathogenicity and enhances uh, tumor selective replication. Um, it basically makes the virus less pathological, um, and, and it also enhances tumor selection because ICP34.5 is really important in facilitating the initiation of protein translation. So the presence of ICP34.5 makes protein expression happen more readily as proteins are translated much more quickly. In tumor cells and in other highly replicating cells, protein expression um, also needs to be highly regulated. And so translation of proteins is highly elevated in tumor cells compared to other cells. So if, if this TVEC were to infect a non cancer cell, it wouldn't be able to replicate very well because it's not able to induce protein translation to the level that it needs. However, tumor cells are already doing a ton of protein translation, so the lack of ICP34.5 makes TVEC replicate very quickly in cancer cells. In addition, protein ICP34 was depleted in TVEC, um, and this reduces virally mediated suppression of antigen representation. So ICP-47 in a regular herpes virus will directly suppress antigen presentation to prevent um, cytotoxic killing of infected cells. However, the deletion of um, ICP-47 still allows for antigen presentation to occur in the cancer cell. There's also been another very unique and clever modification that's been added to TVEC. And that is to induce the uh, gene encoding 
the gene expression of GMCSF. So TVEC actually carries a copy of GMCSF in its genome. And when TVEC in infects cancer cells, these cancer cells start producing a high level of GMCSF. And GMCSF is really critical in enhancing systemic anti-tumor immune responses. So this is a pro-inflammatory protein. It'll recruit monocytes and neutrophils um, and allow for a much more active adaptive immune response. So not only was TVEC modified such that it can only replicate in cancer cells, this oncolytic virus is also inducing more inflammation in the tumor microenvironment, allowing for more tumor clearance. Some other examples of oncolytic viruses include the genetically non-modified ECHO7 strain enterovirus Rigvir, which uh, was used in Latvia, Georgia, and Armenia for the treatment of skin melanoma. So this was a um, evolutionarily enhanced virus that specifically targets uh, this skin melanoma through targeted evolution. We also have genetically modified adenovirus H101, which is used in the treatment of head and neck cancers in China. And also we have uh, the genetically modified adeno delta 24 gd virus, which is really critical in the treatment of glioblastomas. Now this is a really big field, and in order to generate highly effective oncolytic viruses, a researcher really needs to know a high level of virology as well as immunology and oncology. So you can see that this could be a very, very exciting field going forward. So now that we've covered those two topics in great detail, I'm just going to go throw up a couple more examples um, of different topics that are going to be really exciting and currently are exciting in immunology. So first, uh, we have emerging and zoonotic diseases and infections. So these are uh, infections that are caused by pathogens that spread from animals to humans. Um, and some recent really frightening examples were the Zika fever caused by Zika virus and the Ebola virus disease that's caused by Ebola virus. Now the reason that these two were very frightening um, is because of how quickly they entered the human population. Now the spread of pathogens from hu animals to humans and humans to animals happens fairly regularly. However, when there's a new virus, the zoonotic virus or bacteria that's never been in the human population before, such as Zika or Ebola, it makes it really scary because it's spread very, very quickly, causes a lot of deaths, and it doesn't give researchers and clinicians a lot of time to understand how to treat this. And the main question in in this regards is how do we rapidly learn about a pathogen and design treatment and prevention interventions when it, the virus or bacteria is spreading so quickly. So this is a very highly active area of research currently in microbiology, virology, um, and immunology. Another pretty big topic currently happening is interdisciplinary immunology in which the main question is how do different body systems interact and influence each other? So for a very long period of time, for very, very good reasons, uh, when studying anatomy and how uh, bodies work, the different body systems have been broken down so that we can gain an understanding of what each individual system does. So for example, throughout the course of this um, lecture series, you've learned about how the immune system functions. Now, in terms of interdisciplinary immunology, we know that each of our bodily systems, such as the circulatory system, the nervous system, and the immune system, they're all within the same organism. So now a big question that's emerging is, how does the nervous system influence the immune system and vice versa? How do cardiovascular molecules impact immunology? Um, how does the hepatic system influence immunology? And things like that. So these interdisciplinary studies are becoming a very cool place of research, um, uniting various different fields of biology. In addition, another really exciting topic currently is the effects of aging on the immune system. And the big question there is, how does age of the host impact the immune system? Um, as we've learned all these technologies to ensure the health of the human population, the average age of a human is actually increasing as years go on. And we really don't have a solid understanding of how aging can impact the immune system. And so this is a highly active area of the um, current immunology. 
And I know we didn't go through these three topics in a lot of detail, but we went through five general topics today about the new research in immunology and where the field is going. But as we wrap up today's lecture, what I really want to emphasize is that these come from a completely different areas of immunology, from technology development, and really nanobodies come from a basic understanding of protein structure of antibodies. We talked about how we use viruses in a clinical setting, so how do we use knowledge that we uh, have learned about viruses and immune responses against them to utilize them to our own advantage. And we talked about three other uh, emerging fields that are gonna be really critical in um, future studies. But really the fundamental question of new research in immunology and really the future of immunology really lies in what you're curious about. As future scientists and researchers and clinicians, you're at the stage where you can decide what fields are going to be exciting. Um, and when you're thinking about the future of immunology, just think about what you're curious about and try to learn about that. And that concludes our lecture on new research in immunology.